Welcome to the only show about life on the inside by people who lived it. This is Inside Story. As a black person growing up in America, prison incarceration is something we're all too familiar with. The trick is to get you in those tight ass chains and cuffs, and that's where the games began. With every weed that I pulled out of the ground, I felt like I was pulling out a part of my criminal self. Opening of a federal prison often gets politicians raving about all the jobs that are going to be created. But it only took a few years for a prison in Illinois to go from a possible economic lifesaver to one of the deadliest facilities in the country. He's, you know, just an average husband, father. That's him with our daughter. Very, very family oriented person. Christmas, you know, we just, we did a lot together. This is another one, you see the smile, we're, we're out at some festivities. And so wow. this is our Jackie. This is the Jackie that we want back home. Shawana Edwards and her husband, Jackie Edwards, were building a life together. But all of that was put on hold in 2017 when Jackie was arrested for gun possession. He spent the next few years in and out of jail on bond until he was sentenced in 2021 and taken into custody. Looking back on these memories, how, how do they make you feel? You never get adjusted to a loved one being taken away from you. And so, you know, I'm still fighting for him to come home, and I miss him. In February 2022, Jackie was transferred to Thompson Prison in Illinois. Just two months later, guards accused him of illegally having a cell phone. He says he was taken into an interrogation room where he was assaulted by guards and then put in solitary confinement. This is him calling. This, is him. this call is from Jackie Danielle Temple. To accept this call, press five. Hey, baby. Hey, how you doing, beautiful? Sitting here interviewing. Hi, Jackie, how are you? I'm Alexis with, uh, with Vice News. Good, good. Later, Thompson guards claimed Jackie assaulted an officer and charged him with the crime. Jackie remained in solitary confinement past his original release date. He said he was told he couldn't go home until officials concluded the investigation into his alleged assault. He was then moved to yet another facility. I know you don't have a lot of time. I just wanted to see if you'd be able to describe a little bit about what you went through at Thompson. After I was taken into a room, handcuffed behind my back. I was placed on a four-point table, which I was handcuffed in the form of an X. I was like that left for 18 hours, kind of hard for me to talk about it sometimes. My hands were bowling like baseball and bleeding because I had gashes everywhere from the shackles and the handcuffs. I had to stay 69 days, no medical attention. I witnessed abuse several individuals, but it's like a normal thing now. It's like you're caught up in a zombie movie. Nobody there, it's, it's real human. When contacted by Vice News, the Bureau of Prisons said they do not discuss conditions of confinement for any individual inmate, nor do they comment on pending investigations, adding, quote, the BOP takes seriously our duty to protect the individuals entrusted in our custody. The experience Jackie described at Thompson isn't unusual. Investigations by the Marshall Project and NPR revealed it's actually one of the deadliest federal prisons in the country, with a culture of violence from both guards and among those incarcerated. Since 2019, there have been at least seven deaths. Five are being investigated as potential homicides, and two were ruled suicides. A USB Thompson federal prison inmate is now facing murder charges after attacking and killing a fellow inmate. The deadly violence in Thompson mostly stemmed from a program meant for dangerous and disruptive prisoners called the Special Management Unit, or the SMU. In an attempt to mitigate suicide risks in the SMU, the BOP housed two men together in solitary confinement. However, the investigation found that the living conditions actually caused more violence. The same was true when the SMU was originally housed in a prison in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, a facility that was sued multiple times for the high rates of violence among cellmates and use of harsh restraints by staff. 
So for reporters Joseph Shapiro and Christy Thompson, it was no surprise that there were very similar stories coming out of both prisons. So these are some of the letters that we got from men who were either incarcerated at Thompson or had been incarcerated at Thompson. The trick is to get you in those tight ass chains and cuffs in that room that we nicknamed the dungeon. And that's where the games began. In there, there's no camera. They come at you using a shield that has massive gas on it and other people's blood. They rub it in your eyes. Medical comes and checks your vitals and cuffs and lies on the report, says everything's cool. Once they leave, the officers jump you, punch you in your body, private parts. That's where the games begin. Yeah. And we, we heard this name, you know, some people called it like the torture room or the dungeon. And that's usually where they would put them in these four point restraints. We talked to a lot of guys who had scars on their wrists and scars on their abdomen from these restraints, you know, and some of the family members whose kids were killed said that when they got the bodies back, they, they noticed these scars on their body. Some guys called it the Thompson tattoo. What were some of the most shocking findings that you found? I think what really stands out is that they say that this is supposed to be, you know, one of the places where the least amount of violence should happen because they have such high levels of supervision and restraint. However, what we hear from incarcerated people is that they felt like they were intentionally housed with people who were either made specific threats to them or just generally known as a violent person who had assaulted multiple previous cellmates. So we don't know how often is intentional and how often is an oversight, but what we do know is that the level of violence in this place is incredibly high. It's your new place? Yep, it's the new place. Okay. Freedom oh, yeah, Palace. <laughs> Freedom Palace. How's it been uh, just like adjusting to coming home so far? It was super exciting, fun. Um, it's a learning process. Maurice Proctor was released in the spring of 2022 after serving a 28 year sentence for murder. He spent time in the SMU at Lewisburg and was also at Thompson for a work program. What was that like in uh, Lewisburg? I think that was the worst thing I ever been through in my life. It put me in a cell that I don't even think is a 10 by four. I mean, put you in there with another person. I could stick my arms out and I could touch both walls. I could sit on the bed and put my foot on the toilet. The cell is so small that two people can't pass each other. When you get to Thompson, the cells are a little bigger. Not much. The staff come back there, they turn to a gang. They single out people that they want to jump on and beat on every day. They beat on us, no problem. We beat on them, we're being charged with assault on an officer, right? There's no way for us to fight back. This is the prison system that's supposed to prepare us to come home. For years, several Illinois Congress members fought for Thompson to be converted from an empty state prison to a federal facility. But after the report from the Marshall Project and NPR, those same lawmakers called for a federal investigation into Thompson. One of them was Senator Dick Durbin, who went on to introduce a bill to increase federal prison oversight. What was your initial reaction to that report? Well, I was angry, disgusted. Uh, I, I obviously had some buy-in to the creation of this federal prison. And then to hear this, a report that seven people died, for goodness sakes, that's unacceptable at any prison. In my state, I want to know why. Do you have any regrets about opening Thompson as a federal prison? No, not at all. It's going to serve the public and serve the taxpayers who paid for it. Uh, I'm sorry for what has occurred. There's no excuse for it, none. I take it personally because I work so hard to help make this state prison a federal facility and to bring it to my home state. We're also learning that a lot of the violence and assaults that are happening, um, you know, some guards are being accused of that violence, some guards are being accused of housing cellmates together like that are known for violence or may threaten violence. And so how do we change that culture if some of the responsibility might lie on the guards as well? You use the right word, culture. I think there's a culture in the Bureau of Prisons that needs to change. Uh, it's a good old boys network. It covers for itself and that's not unusual in corrupt situations. Most of the guards, I'm sure, are conscientious, good people who are trying to do a difficult job very well. But there are those who are corrupt and they're abusing the prisoners and the system. The investigation by the Department of Justice and any oversight hearings will take months to complete. But Shawana isn't sitting back and waiting on reforms. She's been writing letters to officials 
asking them to look into Jackie's case and advocating to bring him home. Shawan, how does it feel to hear him say those things about you? Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful. I, I couldn't do it no other way. I had to be his voice when he couldn't speak. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't going to let them just assault him and get away with it. During the pandemic, the number of people in prisons went down. But that means the number of people wearing tracking devices on the outside went up. And in 43 states, people have to pay to wear them. In many places, those prices are set by private tracking companies. So it's not clear, even to the courts, how much people are paying to be surveilled. Matthew died a slow, painful death over the course of weeks. The U.S. is doing a terrible job keeping track of people who die while behind bars. Despite a clear charge from Congress to determine who is dying in prisons and jails across the country, the Department of Justice is failing to do so. A Senate investigation found that the Department of Justice failed to record 990 deaths in 2021 alone because of reporting and data collection failures. Commissaries meet inflation and supply chain issues. Folks serving time have reported costs going way up for staples like toothpaste, soap, coffee, and batteries. Some prison spokespeople have said rising commissary costs are similar to what's happening on the outside. But there's a pretty huge difference. Average wages for incarcerated people maxed out at 52 cents an hour and haven't changed in many places for years. It can be a huge help when someone with a platform uses it to talk about criminal justice reform. And that's the case with Lala Anthony. The actor and entrepreneur has spent a lot of time on Rikers Island to prepare young folks for life on the outside. Lala <laughs> Anthony, I have a million questions to ask you. I have a lot of questions for you too. You know, I saw that you have this new initiative on Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, Rikers Island is the, a jail in New York where it houses people who are waiting trial. Can you yeah. tell us about that initiative? My program is all about mentorship, leadership skills, self-esteem building, how to turn you know, a bad situation into a positive one, and also helping the young men that I mentor have opportunities and resources when they are released back into society to make better choices, to get jobs, to get education, and all of that stuff. Can you kind of paint the picture for someone who, who don't understand, like, what are you actually doing? How, what is a session like? We start with a prayer, which is very, you know, important. We talk about the highs and lows of the week. And from there, a lot of conversation could come, like someone said they were gonna come visit me and they didn't show up. And we just talk about like the feelings behind that. And then from there, we go into whatever our lesson of the day is so to speak so it could be a lesson on forgiveness it, we can talk about who's someone in your life that you want to forgive and why is that have you ever told this person well here are the steps to real forgiveness then we go to rec we go to the basketball gym and they're able to play basketball and during that time is when i'm able to kind of have more one-on-one -on -one sessions with each one of them and just check in with where they're at and also a big part of what i'm doing is making sure they understand their case and making sure their lawyers are on point I become like a, a liaison between you know, the lawyer and, and the client. And we work together on the case. We work together on speaking to the judge, the DA, whatever it is. It's, it's a partnership. You know, nobody can do this alone. It's a lot of work. Some people in the community might say, hey, listen, these young kids mm -hmm. committed serious crimes. Yeah, they have. So why should you, Lala Anthony, do anything for them? How do you reconcile with that? I grew up a certain way, I know how shit goes. You know what I mean? The environment, lack of opportunity, lack of resources, no money. Some of my kids grew up in shelters their whole life, no food, no anything. What are they supposed to do? Not making an excuse, but now you provide them with a different way. You provide them with 
opportunities they never had before, and people can change and want to do better. We're all products of our environment, no matter what. Now, some of us took our environment and made, and made it out and made something great, and some of us weren't able to do that. So I'm not a person that just throws people away. Like, I'm a person that gives people second chances with the right tools and resources to make better decisions. It's every kid's not going to come out and do amazing things. That's part of it. But if I can change one, I feel like I, I, I did something. I feel like I made a difference. There are a lot of women who, who have high profile status, such as yourself, who are delving into the criminal justice field. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why is it? Right. Can you answer that? Unfortunately, as a black person growing up in America, prison incarceration is something we're all too familiar with. Like, I hate that it's like that. I hate that we all have experienced family members or friends that have been incarcerated and had to go through certain journeys with them at different times and see the struggles and things. So I would see stuff, but I would be like, what can I do about it? Like, I'm just one person, I'm not gonna be. And then finally I was like, no. There's a lot you can do about it. Awareness, things like this is doing something about it, speaking about it. So I, was, I started just taking more of an active role and wanting to make a change from having friends and family and people I love go through the system and tell me things that were so messed up about it, things that need to be fixed, things that people aren't paying attention to. So what do you talk about with your friends when you discuss this kind of work? Well, I mean, one of my best friends is Kim Kardashian, who is oh, yeah. incredible in... in uh, prison reform and everything that, you know, she's doing. So I talk to her a lot. And I guess what I ask her the most is like, how do I not take it home with me in a sense where I become so consumed with it? I have a 10 to 13 young men in the program. I know each one of their life stories. I know their case. I know their lawyer. I know the time they're fighting. I know when they're going upstate. I know where they're at. It's like it, it becomes your whole entire life. And when I sit in a courtroom and, and one of the young men gets sentenced and I'm sitting there and his mom breaks down and she's asking me like, you know, is there anything you can do, Lala? Please help. Please change this. It's like it just consumes you. So I always ask Kim, like, how do you kind of not let it just take over to where that's all you're thinking about all day and you become like crazy about it because you know I want to preserve my mental health as well and my sanity because that's the only way I can be great to help more people. When you get back to acting like what happens to the kids then like how do you scale how do you replicate what you're doing? You know I'm, I'm a big believer of you know we make time for what's important to us. Like, it's a huge part of my life now. It's not something that I'm just doing for the time being. So it has to now be worked into my schedule to where I could still be there in some capacity. Because what I'm doing, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of patience. It, I just got to find ways to still be able to be, you know, back and forth. OK. Mm -hmm. So what's next for Lala Anthony? I just want to continue to, you know, dig in and do the best I can and hopefully be able to duplicate it in other places and definitely with the female population and just continue to put my heart and soul into it. Giving teens a life sentence isn't really a thing anywhere else in the world, but it is here. Bobby Bostick was one of those teenagers. And in this essay, he shares how a simple hobby has kept them growing. Growing up in the ghetto of St. Louis, Missouri, I didn't see many of nature's wonders. My neighborhood was full of vacant houses, broken down cars, street lights that didn't work, and yards with dying grass. However, there was an exception right in my own backyard, my mother's small garden. When she first started it, people looked at her like she was crazy. Fortunately, my mother ignored them. I watched her water the hard soil and later turn it over with her hoe. After a while, she started planting seeds that would become tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers, and greens. I remember her putting on her straw hat and going out in the blazing sun to arrange rows. She would spend hours out there on her knees while we were out front playing games. But in a few months, everything she planted blossomed, and even the critics asked for some. My mother was proud to share. By refusing to allow the walls of hell to close in on her, my mother created her own paradise. My path to gardening was through pain. In the winter of 1995, when I was 16 years old, I joined an 18-year-old accomplice in two armed robberies. A jury 
found me guilty. I would not be eligible for parole until I was 112 years old. Three years later, at Crossroads Correctional Center in Cameron, Missouri, I signed up for guarding duty. I did it just to get out of my cell, but to my amazement, I found peace like I did in my mother's garden when I was a kid. Weeding the garden became a form of therapy. With every weed that I pulled out of the ground, I felt like I was pulling out a part of my criminal self. Growing a garden forces you to become an engineer, ecologist, botanist, poet, mathematician, and biologist. Working in that beautiful prison garden 22 years ago, I made a vow to feed my mind with books and become a contributing member of society. A few years ago, like a garden that dies in the winter and revives in the spring, I thought I had a chance at a new life, but the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear my appeal. The prison garden continues to help me along my difficult journey. It lets me know that something beautiful can grow from the dirt. Now, I hope for the day when I get released to grow my own garden at home and continue to heal myself in the process. Earlier in this episode, we confronted violence in prison. It might be one of the most famous aspects of life behind bars, thanks to movies and pop culture, but it's also one of the hardest things to talk about honestly. For prison administrators, it's complicated. I know they want to make things safe for everyone inside, but many administrators fear that merely talking about violence will inspire it more. I remember learning that one of the kindest correctional officers you'll ever meet was attacked and put in a hospital. I also remember being assaulted myself by a correctional sergeant then being sent to solitary as if I did something wrong. The Federal Bureau of Prisons' mission is to, quote, assist offenders in becoming law-abiding citizens by providing a safe and humane environment. When that fails, the entire process fails. Justice fails. So if you're a prison administrator, I hope you can set aside your fears for just a moment and think about the story we heard this week. Because this show isn't just for incarcerated people, it's for you too. Thanks for watching. <laughs>